Okay, well, welcome everybody to today's webinar, My Favorite Mistake, Your Favorite Mistake, Learning from Mistakes as Individuals and Organizations. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Morgan Wright. I'm the Customer Marketing Manager here at Kinexus. And today I'm very happy to be joined by Mark Graben as our presenter today. So without further ado. Well, and sorry, I'm going to jump in. Let me point out one other thing. It's a little bit off from our standard work. Um, if people want to um, access links to some of the different podcast episodes and, and, and stories I'm going to be uh, referring to here today, and we'll put this up again at the end, you can go to markgraven.com slash Kinexus 2022. Thanks, Morgan. Awesome. For those of you who don't know Mark, um, you know, this is Mark Graven, of course. He is our senior advisor here at Kinexus. And he actually just had his 11th anniversary. That's a long time, Mark. Yeah, it's been great. That's awesome. Well, Mark is the author of the award-winning book, Lean Hospitals. Uh, Mark is also the co-author with Joe Schwartz of Healthcare Kaizen and the Executive Guide to Healthcare Kaizen. And both books mention examples of our work here at Kinexus. His most recent book, Measures of Success, React Less, Lead Better, Improve More. Um, he is also the creator and editor of the Anther uh, of the book, Practicing Lean. Uh, of course, Mark is the host of several podcasts, including Lean Blog Interviews, uh, Habitual Excellence, Excellence, presented by Value Capture, and my favorite mistake, as many of us know, um, Mark had has his BS in, in Industrial Engineering from Northwestern University and an MS in Mechanical Engineering and, and his MBA from Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Leaders for Global Operations Program. So with that, we'll go ahead and get started. Mark, I'll let you take the floor. All right, Morgan. Well, thank you. Uh, second month in a row for doing the hosting duties. I appreciate you doing that, and I appreciate the opportunity um, to share a presentation today. I originally gave this presentation at our Kinexicon event last month, uh, our annual user conference. It was great to be back together after two years uh, away because of uh, the pandemic. And um, I think you know, the talk was well received. So I thought, well, let's share it here today with the webinar audience. And, and hopefully uh, that outcome is uh, the same today, or hopefully presentation is better than before because we, we do try to practice continuous improvement um, here within Kinexus. So again, you can go markgraven.com slash Kinexus 2022, or you can get the slides using uh, the link that Morgan shared uh, in the chat. So Morgan mentioned uh, the podcast that I started almost two years ago um, called My Favorite Mistake. I make mistakes all the time. You know, we all we have our most recent mistakes, but talking to people in the podcast over, you know, it's been a little more than 18 months and it's been uh, 180 people that I've talked to wide ranging from different industries, different professions, different fields. I've asked this diverse group of people, um, different ages and, and some really accomplished, um, highly successful people in, in their realm and their domain. I've asked them all the same question, thinking in terms of their career or their you know, professional settings or their workplace. What's your favorite mistake? And you know, probably at least half the guests that have to go back and count, their first response, you know, is something like uh, something like this. Um, Dr. Jen Welter, you see pictured here, uh, she was actually the first woman hired uh, by an NFL team. She was hired by the Arizona Cardinals to be an assistant coach um, for uh, their defensive players during uh, one one training camp. So she broke. Um, uh, you know, a barrier there. And, you know, she's been very successful as, as a player in women's football and as a coach for women and for, for men. When I asked her, you know, Jen, what was your favorite mistake? She said, you know, like a lot of people, well, gosh, there are so many. How do I choose? So, you know, of all our different mistakes that we've made, some of them stick with us, right? And some of them become that favorite mistake story. Um, Tom Peters, who you see pictured here, a uh, legendary management consultant and author and speaker um, over the past couple of decades. You know, he said at the beginning when I asked him, 
you know, I said, well, I've, I've made so many mistakes. You know, I presume we've got a minimum of an hour and a half to talk about it. Like, oh, well, Tom, you know, he's, he's a talker, right? I could have talked to him for an hour and a half, but uh, we had about half as much time and, and he shared um, some different uh, mistakes there. And, you know, I think most guests appreciate this framing of the question. What, what is a favorite mistake? Uh, one, one person I got to pose this question to uh, pictured here is Greg Cody. He's uh, been a longtime sports columnist for the Miami Herald uh, newspaper, and he had a different reaction to it. He said, well, what an odd phrase. It's an oxymoron. Why would I consider a mistake to be something cherished and favorited? But we've we've been able to explore that with different guests, and I want to share some examples um, with you today. So even with that preface, Greg Cody's story uh, was one where he, it was early in his career, he was working as a reporter, and he was interviewing uh, a soccer player from Argentina who told what turned out to be a very tall tale about something involving his family and the Falkland Islands War. So this is going back 40 years ago. And Greg Cody trusted what he said and he printed it in the paper and he violated sort of that, you know, that cardinal rule of journalism of have two sources or double check everything. And, you know, Greg Cody learned that the player had lied to him. I think he was just sort of pulling a prank. Maybe he was annoyed by um, Greg, the journalist. And so Greg Cody's reflection from the story was this reminder to always double check. Like you said, if if somebody says their name is John, I'll verify, is that J-O-H-N? And um, to be a little bit more skeptical or cautious um, as a reporter. So that that's what he came up with as a favorite mistake in general. You know, I think some of this pattern, I, I hadn't even really thought this through fully when I started the podcast. You know, I, I loved the song uh, by Sheryl Crow, My Favorite Mistake. I thought it was a catchy phrase. You know, I, I've been fascinated about this idea of learning from mistakes for, for a while now. But kind of hearing the patterns and the stories from these different guests, and it's something maybe interesting for all of us to think of. Do we have a favorite mistake? You know, I think a favorite mistake is one or more of these things. It's something that led to learning that helped your career, or maybe it helped your organization. So you're not really thrilled that it happened, but something you made something good out of it because you've reflected and you've learned. A favorite mistake might be something that hopefully you've learned to avoid repeating. This is where I think there's you know, a strong continuous improvement theme to these conversations I've had with people where I think we would all agree we should be learning from mistakes or problems or defects, whatever words we're using, and react in a way that, that helps us uh, improve our behaviors, improve our processes to avoid repeating it from happening again. And sometimes a favorite mistake leads to maybe an unexpected positive outcome. So when people ask me, all right, what are your favorite mistakes? Um, you know, there's a couple of stories that sort of come to mind. Um, you know, Kinexus, of course, is an Austin-based company. I first moved um, you know, with people all over the US, but I, I first moved um, to Austin in uh, 1999 to take a job at Dell Computer. And uh, you would see the picture uh, when the building's pictured here. You know, I, I I took this job at Dell and um, I, I, I stayed with that company not quite two years. Um, it wasn't the right place for me. It wasn't the right fit. I mean, I got to do some interesting work there and it wasn't the worst mistake I ever made, but it was a favorite mistake in the sense that uh, working there at Dell, I met my wife and we've been married for more than uh, 20 years. So I don't think, and to be clear, I don't think she considers marrying me uh, to be a mistake. And I certainly don't view it as a mistake. So I don't want anyone, please don't tweet that Mark Raven said, give me, no, no, that's not what I said. But the favorite mistake of taking that, jo that job at Dell um, led to something, um, thankfully, very positive. Ron McGill, I got to ask him this question. He's a zoologist at um, Zoo Miami. And his story was surprising, and it was a little more um, dramatic. You know, he's, he, he described how he was a young zoologist, um, he, he said he was cocky, he got careless, and he was working with a crocodile, and he got his right hand bitten really badly. He ended up in the hospital. Um, now, you know, he uh, you know, still has use of his hands, and thankfully, you know, it didn't get bitten completely off. 
Um, but similar to my story in, in a more dramatic way, one of the nurses who was caring for him in the aftermath of the crocodile bite, again, became his wife. So not not to be clear, again, not the giraffe he's pictured with there, but a human woman who was his nurse. And that's why Ron McGill considered that to be his favorite mistake. So these stories might be, you know, kind of cute or nice or you know, kind of in the categories of what uh, Bob Ross, uh, the painter back in the day who had the TV show about painting, you can stream it. You know, he's still really popular today. What he calls happy accidents or happy mistakes versus life lessons, right? So let me let me share some stories that are a little bit more maybe compelling and impactful um, in terms of um, workplace lessons learned. And I'm gonna actually have to pause one second because I've had painters working in my place and I think they locked themselves out. So forgive me for 30 seconds. If they're still there, let me open the door and I will edit this out. My apologies, Morgan, uh, I'll let you do you have a favorite mistake story? I'll be right back. Oh gosh, putting me on the spot here. Favorite mistake. I mean, I think we all, I think the first thing that comes to mind, of course, is work related. You know, I think we all take jobs that we, you know, we didn't end up loving. We didn't end up staying at similar to Mark's, but that we've learned so much from and that we wouldn't be the same or we wouldn't be, you know, where we are without it. <laughs> I'm going to have to go back and hear what you said in the recording there, Morgan. So it wasn't very story. specific, so I'm glad you're back. <laughs> okay. I, I, I did put you on the spot and I asked you to riff a little bit. Um, that was a different contractor who showed up to follow up on something unannounced. So, so it goes. So back into the flow of things. That's a more recent mistake, I guess. Um, life lessons, workplace situations. So the more serious story I tell when people ask, okay, what was your favorite mistake? I think back to the last manufacturing company that I worked for. This is going back to about 2004. Even though I, I had at that point probably 10 years experience with lean, you know, coming into that company, they still, they wanted to put me through their certification program. It was basically a lean black belt program. Um, they used, well, if you will. So in that certification, I was tasked with going and doing a project. And there was an important business problem where one of the production areas was constantly running short of finished goods inventory. It was hampering uh, the production final assembly. It was certainly hurting delivery to the customer. So I was involved in this technical project of setting up um, you know, uh, changeover points and reorder points and you know, Kanban systems and visual management. So technically, you know, everything I did there, including the math and the setup, I thought was fine and correct and it would have worked. Um, the mistake was not properly engaging the people who really work in these production areas. Now, some of that was, I think, the culture I was working within. It was not a culture that would have allowed me to stop the line for any sort of period of time, because again, they were behind on their production. They weren't, they weren't gonna stop and um, let me really work with people. So I had to catch them when I could. Uh, but the, the, you know, the end result of it was a system that was not really embraced, that was not really used, and it certainly didn't sustain. So you know, I, I take some responsibility for that. I could have, I should have pushed harder against that prevailing culture of, I should have pushed harder uh, to say, hey, let me have time to work with the staff and to get their input and to let them work on this and, and, and all. But the one takeaway for me was to make sure I don't allow myself to be put into that situation again as a, as a consultant, especially as an outsider. If somebody said, we want you to come in and fix it and put in the system for us, I would politely decline and say, I don't think that's a good approach. What I have been more successful with is when I have been able to more fully engage the team and their leaders to help um, develop the change and help put it into place. And so that, that story is, is one that I collected um, with the stories from others in, in that book, Practicing Lean, that I published some years ago, where 15 other lean professionals and, 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 and I shared stories from our careers. What are the things that, I wasn't using the phrase favorite mistake then, but what's a mistake that you remember that if you could go back in time, you, you would try to teach yourself to do things differently? what would you tell yourself? And, you know, I think part of the spirit of the book was this recognition that we all make mistakes, especially early in our career. 
And uh, we, we should be more um, accepting and less judgmental about people who are younger in their career or younger in their practice of lean or Six Sigma or continuous improvement. Um, that's, that's one of my own reflections in terms of mistakes I've made in being judgmental um, or critical of others when maybe I shouldn't have been. But again, you know, a favorite mistake, it's, it's not necessarily your biggest mistake. I think if I asked people this question of what's your biggest mistake, that might just be kind of sad or depressing. But a favorite, you know, a big, a, a biggest mistake might be your favorite. A favorite is not necessarily your biggest, but it's one that was important enough to stick with you. You remember it. You think about it. It's driven you to get better at the least, not repeating that same mistake, but sometimes driving yourself to improve in more significant ways. Matt Booz, uh, pictured here, actually went to elementary school and middle school. Um, he was from my hometown. He, he was involved in sales and consulting. And uh, when I asked him this question, um, he's, he, he, his first thought was, you know, why, why do I cherish this particular mistake? And I think it's, it's just coincidental. It's the same word Greg Cody used. Why would you cherish a mistake? But Matt said, you know, the, the mistake, the story he told it's a mistake I think about all the time, probably every day, probably multiple times a day. And it was a, a story about kind of being behind on a project and not going to his boss for help. So it, it was one thing to not tell his boss that they were behind schedule, that they were in the red, if you will. Um, but but he, you know, the, the his boss was upset that, hey, I could have helped you. I could have gotten this back on track. And so I think as Matt progressed in his own career, he's reflected on that. And, you know, as a leader, I mean, you could lecture people for not coming to you. You could maybe go out of your way to make sure people feel comfortable coming to you when there's a problem or when you're behind schedule or when there's a mistake. So again, when I've asked people this question, what's your favorite mistake? My very first guest on the podcast pictured to the left here, Kevin Harrington, he was on season one of the show Shark Tank. Um, and you know, he, he, was, he was one of the sharks. He was the inventor, love him or hate him for this. He was the inventor of the modern 30 minute infomercial and a lot of these as seen on TV products. Um, George Foreman Grill and Jack LaLanne Juicers and some of these products are really old now. But when he was relatively new in this business, he was talking about a time when he was bringing in basically $2 million a week in revenue. He would come in every Monday and they would do a lot of their sales over the weekend. And he would normally be handed the financials of, you know, how, how do we do last week? And one of these weeks, there was a huge problem where one out of the 12 products they were selling at the time, unfortunately, had a huge defect rate coming from their factory. And the mistake, and, and, and I really appreciated that Kevin Harrington, he, he doesn't have to publicly talk about mistakes. It's probably maybe a lot more fun to talk about all the amazing things you did, but he shared the mistake he made was that basically the credit card payments for all 12 of these products were flowing through the same, what they call merchant bank account. And so with the high defect rates and the customer complaints and the chargebacks, the bank cut off the flow of money for everything. And as he described in the episode, it put the survival of the company at risk. He didn't blame anybody else for this. He took ownership of it. He set up multiple bank accounts. And you know, so, so each product would have its own flow. He learned from this. He adjusted. He made changes to the system that was his business. And in, in a way, it was good that this mistake happened at a smaller scale so that he could learn from it and adapt and not have, instead of um, a $2 million problem, something that might have been a $200 million problem. So I think Kevin, Kevin Harrington set that tone of somebody who is very successful, who is willing to come on and share and talk about a mistake. My second guest pictured Hill here uh, was at the time Representative Will Hurd. He uh, retired from Congress at the end of uh, 2020 uh, from the state of Texas. He told a story about the first time he ran for office in 2010 he won the primary, and, and he won in the sense that he had the most votes, but he didn't have more than 50%. So in the Texas system, he was going to a runoff against the second place candidate. 
his consultants told him, you know, Will, you need to change your strategy. A runoff is different than a primary election. And Will said, and as he was willing to admit in the episode, he thought he knew better. He ignored his consultants. He basically continued the same strategy because he said, well, I had a strategy that got the most votes in the primary. Therefore, that's a good strategy and we're going to keep doing it. But he lost the runoff. And I think, you know, again, there are so many people that would want to throw the consultant under the bus or blame them. But Will Hurd took responsibility for his actions and the result. It was his mistake. Now, to his credit, because he recognized the mistake, because he was willing to admit it and to reflect on it, he ran again and he won in 2014. And he won re-election in 2016 and 2018. Uh, Will Hurd, who's had an incredibly successful life um, as, as a CIA operative, he was the student body uh, president at Texas A&M University. I'm sure we have some Aggies watching and listening today. And I think that's one of the key lessons and the takeaway here. That successful people are successful because they've learned from their mistakes. Uh, I, I did a poll on LinkedIn um, maybe about two months back asking people, if, if you think about the most highly successful people in, in your life, now different people will define highly successful differently, but compared to, let's say, the average person, which statement do you think is more accurate? Are people successful because they make fewer mistakes, because they make the same number of mistakes, but they learn from them, or that they make more mistakes, therefore there's more learning? And I was a little surprised by the outcome, maybe pleasantly surprised, that 49% of the voters on LinkedIn, not a scientific sampling of the population, I realize 49% said people are successful when they make more mistakes and there's more learning. A combined 87% would disagree with the statement uh, that people are successful because they made fewer mistakes. So I think it's interesting, especially I think my followers on LinkedIn are dominated by continuous improvement people, people like uh, the audience for today's call. So there, there might be a bit of a bias there, but if individuals recognize people are successful when we learn from mistakes, I think there's a question of, well, do organizations realize this? If we recognize this as individuals, why do organizations uh, tend to punish people for making mistakes? Maybe that's a question we'll figure out the answer to. So in, in the process of learning and turning mistakes into progress and growth and success, I think another lesson is to reflect on our mistakes, but don't agonize over them. Like, how do we find the balance of thinking about it without being too hard on ourselves, thinking about the mistake without dwelling on it? As my guest Katie Anderson said, you may know her as the author of the, the great book, Leading to Lear Learning to Lead, Leading to Learn. I always make a mistake in saying that, even when I have the words right in front of me. Um, as Katie said, if you keep dwelling on the mistake, then that's counterproductive. And I think that's an important thing to keep in mind. We also want to make sure that we reflect, but at the right time. I interviewed a friend of mine uh, from San Antonio, Lenny Walls. He played um, cornerback in the NFL and the Canadian Football League for a number of years. He's uh, now, uh, he's got all kinds of businesses as an entrepreneur. And I asked him, you know, as a football player, when you make a mistake, there would be, let's say, 80,000 people who saw the mistake in person, and there might be millions who saw the mistake on TV. How do you, how do you deal with that? And he said, well, you know, we were taught to have a short-term memory because you make a mistake and then you might not have to go out there immediately, seconds later, for the next play. So thinking in terms of lean language, you might not be able to stop and do the immediate root cause analysis. But as Lenny said, you know, making a lot of mistakes and trying to learn from them taught him a lot about bouncing back from failures. And I love this phrase that he used, that failures were stepping stones toward winning. And Lenny described how when they would get to the sideline after they were off the field for that series, that was the time for reflection or during halftime or after the game or in practice the next week. Sometimes we have to figure out when can we actually stop and pause and reflect and learn. It might not be immediately in the moment. But a lot of this is really a matter of culture. 
how do we create a culture where it's safe to speak up about mistakes, which then I think leads to a culture of learning and improvement? One of my guests, Dr. David Mayer, uh, told a story of when he was a resident anesthesiologist. The, the surgeon who was the attending, so there's a power differential between the attending surgeon and the resident anesthesiologist. Uh, the surgeon cut into the wrong side of the patient. So that is clearly a surgical mistake. The surgeon made a second mistake, which was more of a choice and basically lying to the patient, not admitting a mistake, but basically lying to the patient and saying, hey, guess what? Uh, we found problems on both sides. You got two surgeries for the price of one pretty shocking, right? David, and, and I wouldn't fault him for this, he said his mistake was not speaking up, not challenging the surgeon, not telling the truth to the patient. But again, it's a matter of culture. That was a very hierarchical culture that, that would not have valued David speaking up. It might have threatened um, his young career. So this was a mistake he observed. It was a mistake he was a part of. Why was this his favorite mistake? It ignited a lifelong passion for him to be a leader in the patient safety movement. Um, so you see him pictured here for a while. He was the CEO of a nonprofit called the Patient Safety Movement. He remains the executive director at the MedStar Institute for quality and safety. So he can't go back in time and change what happened. He can't change what he did, but he can share that story in a way that I think helps others. So I've interviewed a number of people who are formerly at Toyota, and I think it's interesting to compare the culture they have with, within Toyota, a culture that a lot of us here today would respect if not try to emulate. Um, Asao Yoshino, who I got to learn from in person in Japan back in uh, 2012. Um, he was the subject of that book that Katie Anderson wrote um, about his career and about his work. So in, in the episode, you know, he retired after 40 years at Toyota. Mr. Yoshino said, I've made so many mistakes in my entire life, both big and small. And he told the story about when he joined Toyota in 1966. There was a four month orientation that included time in the factory. He was working in the paint shop and part of his job that he was told to do was to add paint and solvent together into a tank that would then be used to paint cars. But people discovered a problem. The paint wasn't sticking to the body panels of the car. Well, Mr. Yoshino had put the wrong solvent in. He had grabbed the wrong container and this meant 100% rework on those vehicles. So what did he learn and take away from this story? How did they respond? He said, nobody ever blamed me. They came to find a real cause of the problem. They could have easily blamed me, but they didn't. They focused on the lessons learned from the mistakes. And we think how healthy and how constructive that is to not ruin his career or put him off of some sort of fast track because of a human error. And, and we look at this through a lean lens and say, well, the process made it too easy for him to make that mistake. The process failed Mr. Yoshino. So his leaders recognized that. They said, it is our mistake as leaders because we did not give you the detailed instruction. And they said, don't worry, we have to figure out how to stop the same thing from happening again. So as Katie reflected, and here you see Katie and Mr. Yoshino together, um, as they collaborated on the book, Katie wrote in her book, the only secret to Toyota is its attitude toward learning. It's people-centered culture and culture of learning. And that's about learning from mistakes and looking at the process, not just at the outcome. And we would, would be better off in healthcare organizations, I think, if we were closer to that culture than we were to the culture that Dr. Mayer described when he was a resident. That's still, sadly, the culture in a lot of healthcare today. So pictured here on the right, speaking of doctors, Greg Jacobson, our CEO and co-founder here at Kinexus, an emergency physician. Um, in our conversation, when Greg was a guest on My Favorite Mistake, he pointed out and reminded us the belief that 85% of defects or errors are caused by an inadequate process and only 15% are true human error. 
So part of our reflections and thinking through and talking about this is Kinexians make mistakes. I make mistakes. We all make mistakes. Our CEO, back to Greg again, makes mistakes. And one of the things that's really great about his leadership, and I think this flows through into the Kinexus culture, is that he's willing to admit them. As he said in our uh, episode, I don't have a problem talking about my mistakes. I'm glad you gave me a month to think about all the different mistakes people could learn from. Uh, Greg is an overachiever. He talked about five favorite mistakes from his career, um, not just one. Uh, But Dan Pink, uh, an author of a book, I think a lot of you probably uh, love a book called Drive about intrinsic motivation and leadership. Um, His most recent book is called The Power of Regret. And in his episode, Dan shared this. He said, I think there's something healthy about leaders talking about their regrets with their team. Because again, I think that sets a really clear example of making it safe for others to talk about their mistakes and to respond in a way that's helpful and healthy and constructive instead of being blaming and punitive. And as a Kinexian or even wearing other hats, I make mistakes. I make mistakes all the time. One thing that we've learned, Greg and I and others, when we've made mistakes in the planning or execution of different webinars, is to turn those mistakes into a new line on the checklists that we use for the planning and execution um, of our webinars. So we started off with an initial checklist. And then as we've made new mistakes, as we've discovered new failure modes, we use the checklist to make sure we don't uh, repeat the mistake uh, again. And so we actually have a planning checklist. We have a day of webinar checklist. That's part of my planning and training to show Morgan how to be uh, a host uh, for these webinars, uh, a role that I normally play. When I think back to, um, this was February of 2021. Um, I was the host for a, a panel uh, discussion that was really hosted and moderated by uh, our good friend, Deandra Wardell. And that webinar was going great. There was so much uh, great discussion and a lot of uh, Q&A coming in from the audience. And so I picture, you know, everyone's out there watching and listening and enjoying this thought-provoking webinar. Um, I was enjoying it as host. I was mostly listening and letting Deandra facilitate that conversation. We were ready to let it run a couple minutes long because there was such rich discussion taking place. And then we all saw this pop up on screen. This meeting has been ended by host. And I thought, wait a minute, I'm the host. What, what, what happened here? Um, so as a lesson, I'll tell you a little bit more of the, of the story here. The lesson, and this is something I've worked really hard to get better at, is to show grace when mistakes are made. And uh, we, a couple of us did some investigation of trying to focus on what happened? Not who did this, but what happened? If it wasn't me who clicked in the wrong place and ended the meeting, what what happened? What can we learn from this? And it turned out it was one of our Kinexus team members who, and this was really the mistake on my part and on our part as an organization, he was sharing the webinar account because he was occasionally doing other webinars. But uh, he had scheduled a meeting and started that meeting not realizing a webinar was taking place, which killed um, the webinar prematurely. So um, I tried to react kind, you know, in a kind way toward that Kinexian. Um, Deandra did just the same. She sent an email here. Um, I'm sure the, the person involved feels horrible. Please let him know I'm not upset and we can classify what happened as an opportunity for learning and improving. And I think, you know, even from what happened there, there was a lesson around remembering to ask, how are you feeling before you jump into the five whys of giving somebody space to feel bad and then to get over that as you try to encourage them and let them know we're not blaming you. Let's learn from this. It was a systemic error that was bound to happen sooner or later. But another thing I will take responsibility for here is that I lost the opportunity previously to make sure that small mistakes prevented big mistakes. And and this is only true if you take action and if you take 
the right action. So let me explain what happened here. So through bad luck, again, my gosh, I've apologized to Deandra about this many times. A previous webinar panel discussion that she had hosted in October 2020 was going fine. And then that same person um, had tried joining as an attendee. But again, because we were sharing that Zoom webinars account, when he joined, he popped up as a panelist. Like, oh, hey, surprise panelist. Now he realized it very quickly. It was like, ah, oh, it was panicky and he bailed out quickly and, and really nobody noticed. So here was part of the follow-up. You know, DeAndre, hey, we, we figured out what happened. He thought he was joining as a guest, but he was logged in. He apologizes. I told him it was no big deal. Now the countermeasure that we had agreed on, he said, well, he'll just watch the recordings because that would then eliminate the risk of joining incorrectly as the panelist. It turns out that wasn't the right countermeasure. If we had realized that there was risk inherent in sharing the Zoom account, which by the way, Zoom tech support told us you shouldn't be doing that because we talked to them about, well, hey, could there be some other systemic fixes in place? And they said the fix was don't share the account. So I'm like, okay, lesson learned. But if we had learned the lesson in October, 2020, we would have avoided putting others in that position in February, 2021. So stepping back beyond Kinexus and our mistakes, I think another key lesson here is creating the culture takes effort. It takes time. Uh, Keith Ingalls, who uh, is a continuous improvement leader at a company that's actually part of Toyota Industries, as he said in his episode, it's a lot of work to create that culture, but it's worth it. So part of that culture is, again, making it, creating an environment. We can't just tell people, you should speak up. You should admit things. We can't just tell people, you should feel safe. We need to make it possible that they actually feel safe, which, again, comes back to the culture. Um, Dr. Nicole Lipkin, a psychologist and executive coach, uh, when she was a guest on the podcast, said, as leaders, you have to promote, invest in the behaviors that lead to psychological safety. You, can, you can't just say, you should feel psychologically safe. That doesn't work any more than saying, I have an open door policy as a leader. and Nobody ever comes in the office, right? Because the first time someone did, they got yelled at. And, you know, you, you can't blame people for not having psychological safety anymore than, than you could blame them for not taking advantage of your supposed open door policy. It's not a one and done initiative, as she pointed out. It takes time. Billy Taylor, a great lean leader, a former Goodyear executive, when he was a guest, he talked about shaping the culture and, and using standards and how the leader sets the standard for the organization. I know Billy did this. Greg Jacobson does that as the leader um, of Kinexus, as one of our leaders. And another example I love of leaders setting the tone comes from a distillery that's located about an hour west of Austin called Garrison Brothers. Um, on the right, you see the founder and CEO, Dan Garrison. On the left is the master distiller, um, Donis Todd. They both came on the podcast. And Don has talked about this element of their culture um, of, of making it safe for people to own up to mistakes. So when people have made mistakes, they will like sign their name to the part of the wall where the mistake happened, right? So Don is, as being someone who reports to the CEO is working really hard to create a culture where it's safe to admit mistakes and to improve from them. Don has told a story in the podcast where long story short, he had overaged some bourbon right? He was aging it because his hypothesis was that it would keep getting better the longer he aged it. And that's true until you hit a point where it's no longer better. And he basically dumped thousands and thousands of dollars worth of whiskey. Dan didn't fire him. Dan emphasized the learning. As Donna said, Dan has always been willing to give me the time to learn from my mistakes. And in the, in the podcast, Dan shared a story of his own mistakes. Right. And so, again, admitting mistakes is very helpful and then not jumping to blame and punishment when people admit mistakes. That leads to a culture of learning and a culture of continuous improvement. 
Um, David May Meyer, pictured here, uh, former Toyota leader, co-author of um, two of the books in the Toyota Way series with Chef Liker, he's actually now distilling um, in Kentucky. He reflected on his time at Toyota and says, you know, here's the ideal, that Toyota operates a no-fault, no-blame culture. He said, now, now kids, at least in his experience, and I think a lot of this happens, kids are brought up with the idea of find fault and place blame maybe schools or, or other influences drive that. And as David said, you know, it took a couple years to clear my brain of the impulse to blame the worker. You know, as with any change, uh, it's easier said than done. Like we can tell ourselves logically, I'm gonna stop blaming people for mistakes. I'm gonna look at systems. I'm gonna be more constructive, but sometimes old habits die hard. As Keith Engels, again, from one of those Toyota Industries companies said, you know, we, we have a process that we go through of unlearning and we teach that mistakes are positive. And, and, and that takes a while, I think, to really fully embrace that. And, and it takes a while to make that part of the culture. Um, back to David Meyer, you would say back to his time um, as plant president or his time at Toyota, the plant president would ask, what have we learned today? And David shared a story about a similar mistake he made of putting the wrong chemical into a machine. I'm sorry, I, that's fine, that's fine. <laughs> Gosh. My mistake is not putting a sign on the door saying, please don't come in, I'm doing a webinar. Um, David made a mistake of, of putting the wrong chemical into a machine when he was making bumpers. Um, it was uh, an $8.3 million loss. And again, instead of blaming and punishing um, David, it was a matter of learning and a matter of figuring out why did the process allow that to occur. So back to Don as Todd, um, one, one last um, quote from uh, Garrison Brothers. He said, you know, there's something about your character growing when you own up to your mistakes. But again, that requires a culture that requires an environment where it's safe for that to really occur. Because to wrap up here a little bit, to, to talk about you know, and remind ourselves, we all make mistakes. Uh, Krista Hughes, who I interviewed in the podcast series, um, she, she, was a nurse, she is a nurse. She's uh, become a patient advocate who works with patients um, to follow up on medical errors when they occur. And um, there's a video clip on the page um, that I'll, I'll, I'll share the link to again in a minute. You have to see her say it in the video, and I'm not going to try to do um, the Southern accent, but imagine this in, in a Southern accent. She said at the end of her episode, well, if you don't think you make mistakes, then, oh, gosh, bless your heart. And those of you who are familiar, like, oh, in the South, bless your heart. That's not as nice of a sentiment as it sounds um, on the surface. That's the Southern use of the phrase, bless your heart. Um, we all do make mistakes. And you know, so we can try to learn how to be uh, kind to ourselves. But some of us lead people who, because they're people, will make mistakes. Um, Karen Ross, who I interviewed in episode three of the podcast, you know, reminds us, um, I, re I recommend her book, The Kind Leader. We all have the opportunity to lead with kindness. And I, and I would argue it's not just kindness. I would argue it's good business when we react um, sort of, you know, constructively when people make mistakes. Um, it's a pet peeve of mine when people say, oh, the root cause of that problem was human error. If that's your conclusion, keep asking why. Why was it too easy for human error to cause a defect or a problem in the process? Um, so I'm inspired by a lot of what Karen says. Um, on the back of this coffee mug are some phrases and mantras. And um, I, I try to, well, I, I put it on the coffee mug to remind myself of these things. And I think these are worth remembering. Be kind to yourself and maybe also to others, but be first kind to yourself. Nobody is perfect. We all make mistakes. What's important is learning from our mistakes. So I'm going to learn from some of the mistakes I, I made here in uh, managing access to my door and not putting a sign on. Because part of the checklist, and a quick story before I hand it over back to you, Morgan. Um, on the checklist, it actually says, for the context of somebody working 
uh, at home where they have kids or being in the office with other people around. The checklist actually says, put a sign on the door that says webinar on pro in progress, do not disturb. And I didn't think that part of the checklist was relevant to me, but my mistake, lesson learned. So with that, um, thank you. Uh, again, you, you can find all sorts of links to the podcast episodes, um, the, the video of, of, of Krista. Um, you can find all that and more at markraven.com slash kinexus, markraven.com slash kinexus2022. Uh, so before Q&A, uh, Morgan, let me turn it over to you for some announcements. Well, thank you again for that excellent presentation, Mark. Um, I'm seeing one question. So everybody, please keep submitting any questions or feel free to share, you know, a favorite mistake that comes to mind. So starting off with some announcements. So our upcoming webinars, um, of course, you can register at www.kinexus.com slash webinars. Um, and our next webinar is actually this Thursday. It's our training team office hours for Kinexus customers only, hosted by our new training manager, Brittany. Um, and that will take place, as I said, this Thursday, June 30th at 1 p.m. Eastern time. Um, and please check out our webinar recordings library as well. Here you can find past training, uh, training sessions as well as Mark's webinars, as well as other webinars that we've hosted. And of course, our blog. So don't forget to subscribe or just go check out our blog. So we have our improvement blog as well as our customer blog. Um, check out our website to subscribe and you can get that uh, sent to your email. And then our podcast, of course. So finally, we invite you to check out our podcast series. Please listen, subscribe, rate, and review via your favorite podcast app. Or you can find out more at kinexus.com slash podcast. And of course, audio from today's webinar will be there as well. So now we'll go ahead and we'll jump into Q&A. Great. And while, while it's still coming out, I was going to share just one other reflection real quick. Um, so when I when I agreed to do, or I, when I say I agreed to, I signed myself up to present this webinar today, mm -hmm. um, asking Morgan to again uh, play host. And uh, I, the last two weeks, uh, my wife and I have been moving, packing up from an old home, coming most of the way across the country, getting settled into a new home. Um, and I thought, my gosh, if I do it on that day, there's a risk that I'm going to have some sort of distraction or something or whatever. And I didn't know what exactly that was going to be, but um, sure enough. But I think I'm, I'm going to leave... I'm going to, maybe I'll talk to you about this afterwards, Morgan, if you want me to leave in your part about asking you and putting you on the spot about a favorite mistake. I'll leave in the parts of the, of the, of the webinar where uh, I had to leave and go tend to the door and oops, because so it goes uh, a webinar about mistakes. Um, I shouldn't try to edit my mistakes out of my life. <laughs> I like that idea, Mark. So we have a few questions mm -hmm. here in the Q and a, so. Hi, it's Mark Raven here again. Um, Ironically enough, given the topic of uh, this webinar, the Q&A session a minute or two in was interrupted and knocked offline um, by a series of mistakes and technical challenges. Um, a mistake of my own, a mistake or two um, by the contractor uh, who was working in my home. Um, so the Q&A will be recorded. Um, thank you for those questions that you submitted. It will be available on our YouTube channel and uh, you will also receive an email notification um, letting you know when it's available and a link um, to that. Um, I, I plan on writing a blog post. Um, it'll either be published on um, Lean Blog or the Connexus blog, kind of sharing some reflections about um, mistakes that led to uh, the interruptions during the webinar. Uh, and again, you know, trying to reflect uh, on what I could have done differently and um, to, to share my best efforts to show grace um, in the face of mistakes. So again, um, thank you for attending live or thank you for watching this recording. Uh, as you know, I, I, I hope today's sessions illustrated, uh, we're all human, mistakes are going to happen. Um, the key is how we react to those mistakes and that we learn and we move forward. So keep learning from our mistakes. Thanks.